Okay, let's, let's launch the first panel then. Uh, Phil, Phil Budden. And Phil is a senior lecturer, a colleague at, at Sloan, and also is just a good friend, and he knows a lot about ecosystems, so there's nobody better to talk about this panel. Excellent, George, you're very kind. Thank you very much. And thank you for taking this initiative and bringing us uh, together. I'll call my panel up in a moment, um, but I just want to say uh, thank you to BT for having us in this uh, fabulous new resource. Um, Sorry, can I interrupt you for a second? Certainly. With two things. Uh, number one, I'm not supposed to give you the clicker. I have can no I have slides, so I'm not going to click yes. anything. And number two, uh, <laughs> this is being recorded. Um, it's not being broadcast. So, so are they going to edit out this bit? Uh, anything you say is going to disappear. Okay, good, yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so uh, roll the tape again. Um, so it's wonderful to be here, and thank you to BT uh, for having us here. This really is a multi-stakeholder uh, event, and that's what uh, I cover at MIT, is thinking about you really do need multi-stakeholders to make a difference on this. So this very event with BT as a corporate, but also various parts of MIT, we have corporate relations here, we have open learning, Steve and Kathleen. Uh, it really does take lots of people coming together on this. Um, and then one word about ecosystems, because rather like AI, ecosystems are getting a bit buzzy and a bit excited. The C-suite has discovered them. Uh, the, New, the New York Times has discovered them. Um, when we think about ecosystems at MIT, we're thinking of place-based ecosystems. And so a lot of people use the terms loosely, like, like Nike's global ecosystem or Apple's business ecosystem, but basically supply chains. We're thinking about place-based ecosystems. And this is why I'm so excited for today's panel, because these big transitions, and it's great that the world woke up to generative AI in March. Um, some of you in technology had been thinking about it for a while, and the term was coined by MIT professor Minsky recently uh, in 1956 when he was working with a British guy called Turing who'd been thinking through these things. And so it's really interesting that we be looking beyond the horizon because in short attention span, politics and publics, people are not thinking about this, but it's people in rooms like this who are going to be looking over the horizon and thinking about what's coming. And I think it's really important that people are taking these skills and talent agenda seriously, whether it's for the institutions, governments, corporations, universities, or for the individuals, the workers, the, the families, the communities, because to be honest, this is going to have real world consequences. The places that do well at innovation, the ecosystems that get on the right side of this will thrive you know, the Bostons and the Silicon Valleys of the world. The places that don't, good people in good places risk being left behind. Uh, in the United States, for example, Detroit. And so there are real world consequences, so I'm really excited. So with that, let me call up my panel. Uh, first, we have Layla, uh, the Vice Dean from Imperial Business School. So have a round of applause for Layla. Welcome up. You're gonna take the far side. Then we have Charlie Bodwell of the International Labor Organization. Charlie, thank you for joining us. And lastly, uh, but not leastly, Bill Pieper of Industry Wales. Thank you for coming up to the stage. So they've taken the clicker away from me because I have no slides. It's all about the panel. And so the slide that will stay up the entire time uh, is, is their names. So after the panel, feel free to follow up with them. The, uh, what we've agreed on for this is I'm going to give them uh, a chance to say one sentence just to introduce themselves so you know who three we've got here. And then we'll start again on the far left and they'll give five minutes about uh, their organizations and the way that they think about, uh, think about these things. And as you'll see, they've curated a very nice multi-stakeholder approach. So Vice Dean Layla, uh, you've had a fabulous international career and we're delighted that it's finally brought you here to London at Imperial College. So will you give us a sentence about yourself? Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm Leila, uh, Vice Dean of Education at Imperial, Associate Provost of Lifelong Learning at the University. I was before at London Business School, IE Business School, and Singapore Management University. So you can see very academic, very educational background. And I do have to say, uh, George is likely the only person in the world who's managed to bring me here today because it's my birthday. Um, oh. <laughs> And I wasn't going to come, but then he said, can you please come? I was like, of course I can. <laughs> okay, excellent. Well, Leila, George is clearly very, very persuasive. Thank you for that. Thank you for being here on your birthday. Can't rule out we won't sing something later. But first of all, going through the panel, Charlie, uh, International Labour Organization. Tell us more about yourself. I have spent the last 20 years almost in Asia. I was the regional advisor on business development, doing everything from entrepreneurship, uh, SME development, up through... Uh, big enterprises and skills development. Uh, in that role, I got to see a lot of different things, a lot of different challenges that we faced. 
The good thing about being on the panel today, I actually am not represented by a robot. Because the first time George had me on a panel, I was a robot sitting in Bangkok operating in Boston. So it's nice to be here in person. I appreciate it. Well, we're glad to have you here. Neither robot nor AI, but here in, in blood and person. Bill, welcome. Thank you for coming in from the, the Welsh borders. Tell us a bit about yourself. Um, well, I, I'm uh, an ex-apprentice at an aerospace company in Gloucester, um, but soon uh, started on the skills agenda. So uh, 35 years working in skills as uh, instructor, trainer, and then uh, awarding bodies, sector skills councils, uh, and the last nine years uh, working for an organization which is an arm's length organization called Industry Wales, uh, arm's length from Welsh Government. So uh, we, we work very closely with the uh, uh, ministers and Welsh Government officials and sort of the go-between between employers, colleges and Welsh Government. And, uh, so we've been going nine years, and uh, it's, we've got some very good results. Excellent. Well, thank you all for being here. As you can see, we've got a multi-stakeholder panel. I'm going to turn back to Leila first, and then we'll work our way through the stakeholders. Academic perspectives, but also global, given the various academic institutions you've been at. Uh, a very international perspective, both Charlie's organization, but also the many things I've read that he's done uh, out there. And then to bring it home to a very specific region, Wales, because it's often think, uh, interesting to think about place-based ecosystem. How do we make difference to particular communities that we care about? So with that, Leila, your five minutes. Um, well, I just wanted to mention a few a few things. And again, thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, so in 20 years of education, I, I obviously have worked with many, many students uh, and also with many companies. And one thing we know is that the moments of change we're currently experiencing seem to be overwhelming and seem to be quite gigantic. However, if you go really into the deep roots, many of the conversations we're having have not really that changed in the last 20 years. If you go to the talent workforce, if you really go to the young uh, work uh, elements we all work with, they are still facing the same challenges. We're still talking about unconscious bias. We're still talking about uh, discrimination. We're still talking about mostly self-awareness. We are in the educational elements uh, always focusing on how can we ensure that students, when they come to us, really understand their potential and companies have the same, uh, the same discussions. Um, so I wanted to mention three, uh, three examples of what has changed uh, significantly and how we address it. Um, one thing uh, when I started 20 years ago is that universities were standalone. You were coming once in your lifetime, you were studying with us, uh, we had some uh, debates with companies, but there was not this ecosystem that we can talk about now. Um, that has massively changed. Uh, to give you one example, uh, Imperial at the moment is building a whole new campus in White City. And that is an interdisciplinary, innovative, hybrid environment where companies, startups, students, and academics are collaborating together. And that is going to reshape the future of how we actually address the educational journey and then help them develop in their professional careers. Why is that so important? Because we're no longer talking about a linear student journey. We're no longer talking about a linear talent development. This has to be cyclical. And this is why lifelong learning is so relevant. For companies, it means also lifelong employability, how we can help everybody develop their talent and understand what they need, but also what power they have. I do hear a lot these days, even today, that AI is changing the workforce. I don't think that's the case. We are changing. We will change the jobs. AI will accelerate that, of course. And why are we changing the jobs? Because we now have AI doing a lot of the things that previously were done by humans. So the approach has to be human-centered AI accelerated. And that is a very different rhetoric because it can be very overwhelming for students, for young uh, uh, talents around the world when they see all these messages coming their way and they don't know what to do about it. And so for us at Imperial, it's really important that we actually message to them that they are the center of the decision making and that they have a voice um, and that they can use all the tools available to develop it. It also has to be a global approach. We talk a lot about diversity. And I actually have lived in eight countries. I thought I knew a lot about diversity. And then I moved to Asia. And I realized I knew nothing about diversity. I had to really change my complete framework on how we adapted all kinds of ways of collaborating. And these ecosystems that we're talking about that are so very relevant. Um, the Singapore government, for example, came to the university and said, we need to work on upskilling and reskilling for the whole society. But that cannot be anyone's individual effort. It has to be a shared approach. 
So what we did is working together with the companies, with the startups, with the government, and with the university in defining how we could shape that educational approach together. So why do I keep talking about educational frameworks? Because I believe, particularly coming from a research-based university, that all these initiatives have to be based on facts, but also have to be based on research. And I would like to break the myth that research is the one thing that happens that is then published in journals and peer assessed and doesn't then have a real impact on everybody's day to day. At Imperial, for example, we're currently working on algorithms that allow us to identify where the research is having real life impact in, in everybody's life, in everybody's talent development. And the third thing around that I would like to mention is this concept of agility. Um, that was mentioned as well this morning. Agility is really important, but it also has to include a way to support everybody individually so that they can, as a team and as a company and as a startup, thrive. For us, this goes through leads. Leads is a framework that is leadership, ethics, self-awareness, diversity, and societal impact. We talk a lot about the workforce, but the workforce today cannot work if it doesn't have societal impact. We know that from Generation A. They're coming to us looking for jobs, looking for ecosystems, looking for development, where they also understand their bigger role in society. So those are just a few examples that we can mention uh, later as well. Um, but the main point around that is that it, is, it has to be human-centered. It has to be ecosystem-driven. Uh, and the university has a big play in that because of the convening powers. Excellent. Leila, thanks for getting us off to a cracking start. Um, I, I think I said a round of applause coming down. <laughs> Far be it from me but to stand in the way of all spontaneous human interaction. Um, and that's a wonderful overview. So thank you for starting off by giving us that perspective. And I, I love representing the universities. Um, it's not just about research that sits on a shelf. And one of the great examples is Imperial, whose president just came to visit us at MIT. It's one of those sort of peer institutions. The research that uh, Imperial is doing is going to change the game. And while some people were surprised by, by AI in March, if you'd been following what Imperial had been putting out, it's a great way to see what's coming over the horizon. And, and that's wonderful. So thank you from the university side. Now we can turn to an international, intergovernmental organization. Charlie, your five minutes. International, international Labor Organization, some of you might be aware of, some of you might not. Within the UN system, we're the ones that are responsible for the sustainability of people, sustainability of work and how people work together. How do you do that effectively? Uh, and in my role, working in Asia, was to support the 20 or so countries across South and East Asia on issues like how do you, how do you develop young people's ability to actually be entrepreneurs? How do you help small businesses? How do you help big ones uh, with their skills and workforce? Now, one of the things that became clear and was it quite interesting. You think those are very different things. But in fact, given the role of the ILO, which is to develop institutions, not we don't do the help directly. We help local partners, government, whoever it is, big business, to do their job better. Now, the interesting thing was the link between those things. Cost and capacity are always the limiting factor. How do you scale things? How do you get out to communities? Well, with SMEs, you're talking about how do you help governments like you know, the, the government Wales support local business? How do you help students in education? It always runs into the challenge of having good trainers and the money to be able to do it. Now, we kept running into that problem across Asia. And what we discovered was Training of trainers, which is the traditional model, doesn't always work. You know, sometimes the institutions don't have trainers. They don't have facilities. They don't have whatever it is. How do you, how do you address that problem? How do you square that, that circle? And the way that we found, we've done a lot of work on activity-based learning. So empowering groups to actually help themselves. Taking the expert out of the equation and putting the activities and the things that people do together to learn. You think that works for a small business? Yeah, you sit small business together and give them tools to figure out how to solve their problems. You put students in a group and have them talk about what kind of business they might want to start and what the challenges are. Multinationals? We did it with Nike, Gap, IBM, Samsung, Seagate, Western Digital, soft skills training, putting people in groups and having them work together to figure out how to solve problems how to be creative, how to work in teams, and so on. So trying to find those, those solutions that address challenges is always our way. Uh, sometimes it's traditional, and sometimes we've got to start looking at new ways. Maybe ChatGPT will help us out. Yeah, excellent. Well, I think we should join him in a round of applause for him too. Well, <laughs> please, Having on. started that trend.
Um, Charlie, thank you for that overview, and it's, it's wonderful. You come from an international organization, one of those great parts of the UN system, and sort of thinking global, but then clearly acting locally. And I think one of the things with ecosystems is people think they're like vague things in the cloud, and they're not. The ecosystems are really down to earth in specific places where you need to go in and, and understand. And it, it's not one size fits all. It's like you no. need to, you really calibrate, and you've both talked about Asia, which could be one of my later questions. So to bring it into a particular re, uh, region and a principality that's close to my heart, because my mum's from Cardiff, mm -hmm. uh, may I now turn to, to Bill and Whale, Industry Wales. <clears throat> well, good morning, everybody. Um, just a, a little bit about um, Wales and, and the manufacturing sector, which we, we uh, support. So we've, we've got uh, 5,000 companies, a mixture of, of small and big. Um, we, we've got some big, big players like Toyota, um, Air, um, Airbus, so some huge ones like that. We've also got Tata Steel and Salsa, but we've got some very small companies as well that are very active in space um, and, and those sort of tight tech areas, um, as, as well as uh, some of the bigger IT companies, and I, I class IT companies, digital companies, such as Admiral Insurance, which is, is founded and based down in, in Wales. So we've got quite a big um, span of, of companies with big names and, and that sort of thing. Um, we've also got uh, a great track record <coughs> on, on skills, working with um, Welsh Government. When I say we, I, I mean Wales as, as employers, not, not industry Wales. Obviously, we do work well with, with, with Welsh Government. Um, but back in 1995, um, Wales actually uh, piloted the, the modern apprenticeship uh, when that was developed. Um, as, as, as uh, part of the UK. So we, we got every, every company uh, that took apprentices in Wales trialing that, that out uh, with, with dreaded things like key skills, which had never been seen before. Um, so those sorts of things we, we've trialed. Um, so as I said earlier, 30 years working in Wales in, in this sort of arena. Um, how have things changed? Well, obviously, as, as been high on the agenda today, uh, driven by automation and, and data collection. Uh, basic skill requirements um, from an engineering point of view are, are, are similar to what they've always been. But if you're talking about apprentices, the skills that they require a higher level now than they were, um, say, 10 years ago. These apprentices have got to make decisions on the equipment they're using, um, and, and they're in charge of, of, of the work they do. There's no um, reporting to someone to say, actually, this isn't going quite right. They, they sort things out themselves now. And obviously, there's a, a learning curve on that. But just as they're finishing their apprenticeship, they are really operating at a high, high level. So those things need changing. Um, th there's cross-cutting themes creeping in, uh, uh, like net zero and, and carbon reduction, that we, we really need to uh, look at. We've done quite a uh, a bit of work on that, and Welsh Government have set up um, Industry Wales Net Zero to work with companies to help them identify how they can reduce their, their carbon output. And, it, and it's across the board. It, it's, it's not just operating machinery or in the steelworks changing the, 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 the fuel. It's about design of products. So it's all about, it's the whole thing. So really everybody's role, everybody's job 
has to take into account of some of the demands that the, the climate is, is putting on, on everyone. Um, so what have, what's Welsh Government's a, approach to identifying talent? Well, if we went back 10 years, uh, the approach was give us information, tell us what skill shortages you've got as a sector. Um, but that has changed in Wales. So Wales uh, set up regional skills partnerships and their role is to identify skills in their particular region. So there's four regions in, in Wales. Um, and the way they do that is have employer boards for the sectors and every five years they produce a skills plan of what are required for the particular sectors but that is reviewed on an annual basis and the, those plans are submitted to Welsh Government who adapt their policy or uh, they, they even work with short-term um, plans as well that that help specific issues that are cropping up. Um, again, one time companies could employ people if they had a vacancy, they could advertise and there would be plenty of applicants. Those days have, have disappeared, um, mainly due to large employers are not shedding employers now, employees now. So the SMEs can't pick up those, those people. Um, they've, they need to actually start to, to train their, their own and they've been doing that probably over the last five years and some small companies have been um, opening training schools to, uh, to, to actually provide extra support to the, for their specific skills so that's very positive. Um, in terms of provision the colleges have been able to um, renew a lot of their facilities, uh, either brand new buildings and equipment or refurbishment of existing um, uh, sites and I think that is, is, is all of them. And there's also uh, in the pipeline uh, some brand new centres um, about to, to be built and, and the idea is in it specifically for manufacturing, that it, it caters for schools right the way through to, to apprentices um, and then links into the universities. So there's quite a few things going on. Um, I'm probably at me five minutes. Yeah, you, you are, but that was a fabulous five minutes. So a round of applause for those five minutes. Thank you. And as you see, we can work, we've worked through from the global, the research perspective, through the international uh, to a very uh, important, uh, small, perfectly formed part of the world, yeah. Wales. And I think we have some other colleagues from Wales here. Do you want to put your hand up so if you're amongst us? Yes, excellent. So if you want to hear more about Wales, people, Matt and Susie, right here. Um, right, so Leila, picking up on what you said there, you are vice dean for education. You talked about the way that education you need. It's not like university is a one and done. You now need to maintain lifelong learning. Will you tell us a bit about the approach at Imperial and what you see from your research is needed, given the pace of change? Um, yeah, happy to share. And um, so I think what what we were talking about right now, you mentioned about the, the skills um, and what uh, young students are looking for, um, is uh, really go deep into what are the secondary, the uh, high school students telling us at the moment of what the education will look like when they come to universities. And then uh, vice versa, we also have to look after once you have graduated, when you go to the workplace, what are the skills you're going to need, what are the skills that companies demand from you. Um, and that means for us reshaping slightly our educational approach because what you will know from universities that you will have done an undergraduate or you will have done an MBA or you might have done some executive education but it's a one-off situation in your life maybe twice um, a very traditional linear life means that you will have you know studied when you're 18 then you go to have a short period of time of work then you maybe do an MBA then you have a very long period of work and then you retire and that world is gone <laughs> 
We might like it, we might not like it, but that, that world is no longer there. And we are seeing from Generation A and Generation Z that they are working and creating uh, lives that are very global, that are very movable, that are um, patched together to their own interests, um, and that require from universities a response. Uh, and so from what, what it means is we have, all the, we have all the content, we have all the ingredients, the same for MIT, of course, you have an excellent lifelong learning portfolio. Um, and uh, what we have been able to do is actually frame it in such a way that really adapts to you. I call it precision education. It's uh, taken from the medicine environment where we can really foster a very precise intervention to medical uh, situations. Education should be the same. You should be able to tailor the educational approach you need in your particular journey and in your particular moment of life. And so that is when it comes to the lifelong learning journey that will guarantee lifelong learning employability as well. Um, and then to finalize as well, um, I think from a company perspective, what we're also trying to do, and I, I was on the board of uh, the Graduate Management Admissions Council, and we surveyed 5 million uh, students all around the world and asked them how educational was changing their, their career perspectives. Um, and uh, we got fantastic feedback. One of the things they were saying is, companies have the opportunity to take data points from universities on what is coming their way. Um, when you're 18, when you're 19, what we're seeing now will come to companies three, four, five, ten years later. And we can give that information to you. The, the challenges we're facing at the moment, resilience, mental welfare, uh, the, the need for societal impact that I mentioned before, that's things that companies can collaborate with universities on to adapt to not just a lifelong learning journey from an education perspective, but also from a careers perspective. Excellent. Thank you for that, Leila. Uh, turning to you, Charlie, you mentioned also this lifelong learning, but perhaps for those who are in the labor force already, which is rapidly changing uh, around them. And I wonder what sort of insights you have about that, particularly as you mentioned chat GPT, which is sort of tech of the moment. Um, I'm just wondering how you see things changing yourself. A uh, quick vignette on chat GPT. Yeah. So I'm, I'm working on finding my replacement because I've moved to headquarters a couple of months ago. Uh -huh. and. This position out in Asia that I've been sitting on for a lot of years is now being recruited. We needed to come up with a series of questions. Our traditional model is written test, interview. Long list, then short list, then selection. We do the written test, and everybody's like, but now we send that out. You have two hours to write it, and then you send it back to us within those two hours. They only need 10 minutes. Yeah, of course. We plugged the questions that I drafted into ChatGPT and went, that's yep. all done. That whole model is done. Now, I, I kind of am like the, we used to have an ad in the States about this guy talking about a hair growth thing and, you know, and he says, I'm not just the owner of the company, I'm a customer. Now when it comes to skills development, I'm the customer too. I've got four boys, all in high school, all, you know, three years, four kids, don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, I'm very concerned about this issue. And, and, and a thing that you touched on was higher level skills. What are these things that people need? Uh, what we're hearing isn't about the hard skills as much as it is the soft skills. The ability of these kids to be resilient. They're, they're getting all the hard skill stuff. They're getting their math, their science. You know, it's really impressive. Uh, you know, I'm not British, you might have seen. Uh, but the school they go to is fantastic. But is it developing the resilience, the ability to think? And I think that's what's going to be really important. What we've been focusing on in the program that I was, I was responsible for in Asia was really how do you develop people's skills in a model that's scalable, that is easily rolled out by companies or local government or NGOs. Uh, figuring that out, whether it's using ChatGPT or using online learning or using our activity-based model, using all of them, whatever fits is what we're looking for. No, that's a great example, and I, I heard that we, um, they gave a briefing to us MIT faculty on chat GPT uh, in February, just so we're ahead of the curve, and some of them said, well, what, what when our students start using it? It's like, yeah, they did course. last semester. Yes. <laughs> you wonder why all those papers before the Christmas holidays were so good? I can give you examples of, of teenagers pretty, using it quite heavily. Yeah, it, it, it's out there, but I, one of the great benefits of being at MIT, I have amazing students. I have one of my executive students here, Katie, put your hand up, who did an <coughs> AI startup in the international hotspot of Michigan on AI two, three years ago. 
And so staying close to these students, whether they're high school students or executive students, you know, they are seeing the ways that things are going to change, and I think it's really helpful. So I look forward to your panel this afternoon, Katie. All right, Bill. You st I had not realized that <coughs> Wales pioneered apprentices, and you had experience of that. How do yeah. you see that changing as we now head into these 2020s, supercharged by these great global trends, especially AI? Yeah, well, uh, over the last few years, um, the, 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 the frameworks of apprenticeships are, are changing. Uh, in England, they've moved from frameworks to standards. Wales and Scotland are still keeping their frameworks. But they're, they're adding in behavior skills and, and these sorts of things. So that's all, that's all coming in. Um, it, a, apprenticeships as well, over the last four or five years, um, we've got degree apprenticeships. I think it's across the UK. Wales uh, was 2019 when we, we did that, probably the first group was 2020, but uh, uh, and, and what we're finding for manufacturing in in Wales with degree apprentices is that the m vast majority are going on to a degree apprenticeship, having done a, a level three apprenticeship. Interesting. So that they're, they're moving as a progression route, and very few uh, that I can think of. Uh, are coming from a level route um, <coughs> so it, it, it for, for manufacturing I think that's the traditional side of things where they've got to have practical skills to to uh, to to move into manufacturing um, but we've got a few companies that are taking um, a level students uh, but it is a long apprenticeship, about six, six years wow. to, to, to do that route. It is the same, it's the same length of time for <coughs> someone doing a level three apprenticeship then going on to do a degree. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the same length of a time, but for a, an 18 year old to see six or seven years in front of them of, of studying mm. is, is quite, quite a lot, whereas yeah. I think when you're mixing that all in with uh, work, workplace learning and, and practices mm -hmm. and getting competencies, overall, it, it's quite a, a, a good route. And of course, they're getting paid as well because they have to be employed. So it, it's, a key, it's a key point. Um, and it, it, in fact, uh, the end of last year, we had a group of employers from the rail industry in in Wales, uh, asking, could Welsh government support a, a pathway into rail uh, degree mm. apprenticeship? And so we we've done a, a fast track on that. We we got the companies together, and the, hopefully over the next uh, month, the degree program is going to be approved and the apprenticeship framework. So there's a lot of things going on like that. Um, yeah. Excellent, well, I'm glad to hear that. And it also shows you the diversity. It's not just like it's a three year yeah. university or four years no. if you're in America, but there's other ways to get that early stage training to go out into the workforce. Yeah. yeah. Now a quick question, because I'm gonna to turn to the audience in a moment. Will there be handheld mics for yeah. that part? Yeah. Excellent. So um, while well, Marie goes and secures the mic, and please put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question, because Marie will fast track it to you. Um, a rapid fire through here. One thing that you think is of concern. There's great plans, there's research, there's international efforts, there's local regional efforts. What, what do you think could go wrong? What should we as a group be worrying about to set us up for the day? Leila, what should we worry about? Gosh, <laughs> where to start? Um, uh, right, that's a hard one. I'd say what I hear the most, and I actually I disagree. I do hear that chat GDP and Gen AI is the biggest concern we should all be worried about. Okay. And I actually disagree with that, and I can explain why. But I will tell you where my biggest concern is. If we want to build successful ecosystems and collaborate between, as I mentioned, companies, startups, universities, government, 
the one thing that tends to happen is that the processes in the systems are just not fit for uh, purpose. That is a very operational comment, but yeah. I do want to say that I find a lot of very bright people that do want to work together, and I use the terms friend competitors. We might be competitors, but we can be friends. And if you think about the educational aim and the vision and what we're trying to achieve here, I think everybody has a really, really good will. Um, but what usually tends to happen is that the processes and the systems that underlie all of us are just not fit for that. And so then it means that we can't really do it because it takes too much time. And so if we could find a way to official, efficient like that, then I think we could actually okay. collaborate more. Excellent. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you for the new word, Fred Petitus. Um, <laughs> do put your hand up if you'd like the, the microphone. Charlie, what should we be worrying about? I, I hate to say worried. I think we should be, be interested in and deal with. Uh, I, I, when I look at young people these days, George's concept of thriving, I think a lot of young people, they want to thrive. They don't want to have jobs. They don't want to do what you know, we did. Okay, graduate, I work my way through university, and then I'm going to get a job. And they want to thrive in what they do. And I think we, as people that actually have an influence on all of that, we should be trying to help them, in fact. And I think companies that do that, I think they do better. Okay, excellent. So Bill, not what you're afraid of, but what are you interested in and uh, welcoming as, as changes out there? Um, well, I'm, I'm welcoming the, 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 the changes that are, are coming along in terms of uh, technology. Mm -hmm. I think it will help to attract younger people into the sector. Um, and, and I don't think we, we should be afraid of of that, that technology coming in. And I often say to people, when I started my career um, it, it, doing this sort of work, um, I, and, and again, 30 odd years ago, working from home, but out and about sort of four days out of five, and you get home, there'd be a, all your messages on the floor from the fax machine. Then you went to work the next, door, next day to do your visits with your list of people that you needed to ring. And you either had a friendly company that you said, could I borrow your phone? <coughs> or you went to a, a pay phone. So you think of the changes now. And also at that time, there were, weren't computers on everyone's desks. But everyone's got a computer. And people were worried about secretaries and things like that, but they have all got better jobs than they had, and you, you know. So let's not worry too much about it, but let's make sure that we've got infrastructure in place to yeah. to actually make sure that the avenues are open. Leila, yeah, did you I want to quickly come in before I turn to the young man at the back with the if microphone? I, if I can say something, because Charlie, I, I very much agree with you that, that young people want to thrive. But I also want to mention that we, the, it's a society of, of just so much information at the moment. Mm. They have so many options. And for some of them, it becomes very overwhelming. Uh, and we put them then this image of what success looks like and that we believe in them and that they can make it. And sometimes that's actually not very helpful. So they want to thrive, thrive in their own terms and in their own speed. And we have to give them the, that space so that for that to happen. Because we have seen, particularly in the UK, the rise of mental unwell-being with young uh, students is quite concerning. And the pastoral care we have to put in place for all of us is actually one of the biggest priorities. So just wanted to. OK, great. Thank you for throwing that in. Uh, the gentleman at the back, will you identify yourself and ask sure. your question? I, I was the fellow from yesterday, and I'm continuing asking questions on this. So, uh, I don't think MIT and Imperial need to worry too much about getting bright, motivated students. What I'm curious and concerned about is how do you motivate the middle? How do you motivate the mediocre? My concern for ChatGPT, one small example, is these technologies will be used for shortcuts rather than as ways to make sure that you're doing, quote unquote, a better job. So, if we can segment down to the second quintile or even the third quintile in terms of the way you're discussing talent ecosystems, I think that would be interesting. Excellent. And as the microphone makes its way uh, up to the front for the Generation A lady here, um, who would like to take a first swing at Michael's question? 
I can briefly mention on, on one thing. I, I obviously agree with you on the part of the, the students that come to Imperial and MIT are very bright from all over the world. Uh, but they're not uniquely shaped. Uh, I have a sticker on my laptop that says unique minds don't think alike. Uh, and uh, I very brilliant minds don't think alike. Um, but what Imperial's mission is, our learning and teaching strategy is actually to increase our impact and to increase our reach. And one of the biggest discussions we have constantly in every meeting we go to is how can we achieve that? How can we reach the young educated minds or uneducated minds all over the world and allow them to access that knowledge, that education? And this is why lifelong learning for me is so relevant because it does not talk in our field, you were saying it before, about it has to be a degree, it has to be three years or five years or one year. It is how can we give you any knowledge and reach you no matter where you are? Um, and, and I think the, all the, the biggest universities have their big responsibility to, pray, uh, to play. You mentioned train the trainer. Um, that is not always successful, but it's also how can we share, how we can put the barriers down to make education available. And that should be part of our mission. Excellent. Charlie, Bill, do you want to come in on that one before we take the next one? Well, sure. Of course I'd like to come in on that one. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think it gets to your ecosystem issue. There's so many different angles that have to be looked at. It, it is about training institutions that have trainers. How do you get them to actually involve these people? How do you get them to be able to reach out to, to less, uh, more vulnerable populations, more, more, more less, less uh, advantaged than the imperial kids, who, who you know, might come from a very, you know, any kind of environment, but they somehow had that drive to make it to imperial. And, and the ones that don't, you have to come up with something within the ecosystem. There's companies that have to do things. Those people are going to work somewhere. How do those companies get those people engaged? What kind of work do they do with them? Uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a man with a hammer who sees the world as a nail. I've got my training model and this is what we do. <laughs> but in fact, there's so much more. You know, within the ILO, we're concerned with labor standards. How do you give people an avenue up? Well, part of it is giving labor protection for people who want to join unions. Pardon me, I, I use the U word. But uh, you, who want to join unions, who want to have protections, who want to have their rights, who want to have good jobs. And, and I think you, you have to look at the whole system and how it, it affects all of those things. How a company like BT can do things and how a government like Wales can do something to help those communities. Mm -hmm. And on Wales, Bill, you should know the microphone has been taken by the Welsh government, so answer carefully. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's something that um, over the years has, has always been um, a talking point. And there's, there's been quite a lot of programs available, um, and a, a lot of them successful. Uh, I think. You, you know, if you don't if you don't go to university and you don't do an apprenticeship, the, you have got to get a job at the end of the day, um, and and that might be easier said than than done. But there's plenty of opportunities um, with with employers now. Um, I think more so than we've had in the in the future, in, in the past. Um, and you, you, you know, a, a lot of the attitude is is a big thing of, of how uh, young people portray themselves to, in a company. And again, again, you, there, there needs some work done with employers because mm -hmm. you can't take someone um, and and put them in a company and expect them to be running at the same speed as the company. Yeah. So there needs to be programs in place. And I think in, in Wales, we've got some good programs. Um, I'm just trying to think of the, the name. It, it's, our, our question, ask it, they... It, it's something like the junior apprenticeship for, or, or young, young person's well, guarantee. Young person's so guarantee. We have That's several people caught my eye for yeah. questions, but we only have time for one question. So uh, I get a... So make it a one sentence question and I'll quickly throw the mic around and we'll assemble these three <laughs> points of view into one question. It's a really quick one. Um, uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm interested in how we get to the parents mm. and it's because I'm hearing it time and time again when they're talking to their children about their career pathways, they're modeling the jobs that they under understand, that they recognize. Mm. 
clear pathways. We advertise in government, the amazing NHS, you know, teachers, really fantastic career jobs and opportunities. But how do we translate the jobs of the future that we don't know how to present them in an image? Mm -hmm. Project managers, you know, coders. How do we get parents to help their children access those pathways because they create the cultural blockers? Excellent. All right. Somebody ready to answer the parent questions? Victoria caught my eye, so let me. So it's going to be hard to merge our questions, I think. I know, it's going to be really hard. <laughs> but we're having too much fun. Go on, throw it so out. So mine was around, um, I'm really fascinated by like looking at the system as a whole and the system conditions that can enable change. And even within one organisation, it can be really hard to get sustainable change. So I'm particularly fascinated about how you go about that globally, because uh, that's a massive challenge. Um, so yeah, interested in that side. Okay, excellent. And there was one back here, yes. And then that's it. Then the panel gets to answer any bit of that they like. So I think, Charles, you mentioned about the future of assessment. Um, so I'm just really interested in terms of what do you think assessment should look like when we're looking for softer skills? Okay. And let's, written exercises. and let's use your answers as a wrapping up of the panel. So, Leila, would you like to go first and answer any one oh of those questions God. you okay. like. Uh, Leave the others to the boys. I don't think you can assess soft skills. I think what you need to do is provide self-awareness toolkits for, for everybody to actually be aware of where their soft skills, soft skills are and, how, and then allow them to develop it. Um, you're absolutely right about parents. I absolutely think that we need to do a better work in working with the communities. White City, for example, the new campus building for us will have open spaces where we invite all of the community to actually see research teaching. And if you don't reach <coughs> the parents, then you are shaping role models in the future that might be obsolete. Um, and on the framework, that is a very long discussion. <laughs> you guys may need to take uh, that over coffee. <laughs> we might need to take about. But um, I think if you, if you work on educational frameworks and communicate them properly and provide the purpose of it, um, and uh, also adapt it to local, we talked about the cultural differences, also understand that what you bring might not work in other areas of the world. Um, uh, and then connect with all the right decision makers and the voices in those regions, then you can uh, have a global impact. And I just want to mention, going back to the previous uh, question about the reach, uh, one supply chain open course of MIT has 200,000 attendees in a year. That's only one. They have many, many more. And that's a way of reaching and creating a voice and uh, uh, an, an understanding that then connects to how it all fits together. So yeah. No problem. Happy Excellent. Brief. Charlie. Well, I'm going to skip the ecosystem one and move. <laughs> <laughs> it is a complex. And I touched on that already. I think, as you said, I think soft skills are extremely difficult to assess. And I, I am not a strong believer in it. Uh, labor ministries when they do skills development and you say, we're now gonna do courses on soft skills. Okay, what are the competency standards we're gonna set? Are you gonna be a level three problem solver or level two team member? I believe in just integrating those things, having those courses and having people go through them, whether you measure them or not, they're part of everybody's job. Uh, and, and so, and, and what was the third one? I'm sorry. Parents. 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 Do you, Parents. Be, do you, want to you know, as we, you're a parent of, I'm Eight children of four. in three years or something? <laughs> <laughs> there were twins in the middle. It's the secret. Uh, the, and the th fourth one was an uh, absolute surprise. <laughs> parents. Uh, <laughs> the parents. I, we always went for the kids. I've got to say on my programs. Uh, we, we, but I think the way to do it, when we work in Asia, we work at the national level, it is really to have promotion by the government that this is a thing you want. Mm -hmm. You want dynamic, and, and it gets to the kids, it gets to the parents, and it becomes a community thing. So if you look at Cambodia, the prime minister is behind entrepreneurship, and it's really important. And that communicates down, and the labor ministry gets on board, and the education ministry works with our tools to roll it out countrywide through all the kids. Wonderful. So, Thank yeah. you, Charlie. Bill, a final minute. Just, um, just on, on the, the parents thing, um, it's a, it is a really difficult one, but I, I think if, if I was to point to some examples, it, it would be what tech values are doing, um, it, looking at um, working at, with schools at, at a young age, school children, so that they go home and, and tell their parents in an enthusiastic way. Um, we, we've also got um, 
the engineering um, yeah. uh, careers uh, program that it's more A level students that they work with A level students and they link with with employers and that always gives really good results and they celebrate it they yeah. celebrate it with, with with parents coming in in, a, in somewhere like the Celtic Manor down in, mm. in Wales, which everyone's yeah. familiar with, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. um, and, and they right. do those sorts of things. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. And I'll tell you about Celtic Manor later. Um, <laughs> this has been a wonderful panel. We have run out of time, so there's no time to sing Layla Happy Birthday. But please join me in a big round of applause for these three wonderful panellists. <laughs> <laughs>